As part of C-SPAN's Alaska Weekend, here's an interview with Alaska Senator Dan Sullivan. He talks about the top issues in his state, as well as his support for Supreme Court nominee Brett Kavanaugh. This is just over 20 minutes. So, Senator Dan Sullivan of Alaska, it's July. Yes. What's going on in Alaska? This oh my gosh, everything's going on, Peter, right now. You know, I always say there's no season in Alaska that's not incredible, right? We have all the seasons, but as you can imagine, in the summer, the vibrancy, the state, it really, really comes alive. So, you know, our fishing communities are in full swing. You know, we have the biggest salmon runs in the world. It's always a bit of a challenge, you know, each year certain Certain runs come in really strong, others don't. So we, we have to watch for that. It is a bit of a concern. But the vibrancy of Alaska, it's alive. We have a lot of tourists um, that, that come up, of course, in the summer. But um, every, every part of the year is a great part of the year in Alaska. Um, July has a lot of uh, energy, right? The midnight sun's out, and uh, you just get a sense of the vibrancy of our people but of the wildlife, and uh, hopefully you guys are seeing it on the road trip. It's so great that you're, you're up there, and congratulations on 25 years of doing this, but we're very glad you're out on the road in Alaska seeing our wonderful state and, and it our is, great people. It is Alaska weekend on C-SPAN. How did you get to Alaska? So my Alaska story is pretty simple. Um, I fell in love with a beautiful Alaskan woman when I was a young man, and um, we decided we were gonna live in Alaska. And if you ever met my wife, uh, you would understand why I hightailed it up to Alaska after meeting her. So very simple, beautiful Alaska native, uh, Athabascan woman, proud family. I have a great mother and father-in-law. And um, after my first tour in the Marines, uh, Julie, and, Julie and I moved to Fairbanks, her hometown, and started our life there. Now we have three wonderful daughters and uh, a great life in Alaska. But yeah, for me, it's uh, simple. Well, you mentioned- It was love. You mentioned- <laughs> Love for the state, but first and foremost, love for my wife. You mentioned your uh, service in the Marines. You recently said that Alaska is very important when it comes to missile defense for the U.S. Yeah. Well, you know, I always like to talk about Alaska constituting three pillars of America's military might. I'm sure you've seen some of this on your um, road trip. First, we're the cornerstone of America's missile defense, and that's more important than ever with the, you know, rogue regimes like uh, North Korea or Iran, both the, the major radar sites, the home, the ground-based missile interceptors at Fort Greeley, that is all based in Alaska. And we even have significant testing of missile defense systems in Kodiak. So it's the real systems, the radar systems, and we're building that up and very strong bipartisan support to build that up. So first and foremost, we're the cornerstone of missile defense. Second, we're a hub of air combat power for the Arctic and Asia Pacific. We, you have probably saw it on your trip. Uh, all kinds of U.S. Air Force assets. We're going to have um, over 100 fifth generation fighters. Those are the supersonic stealth fighters, F-35s, F-22s. We're gonna have over 100 when we have uh, F-35s coming to Ileson in the next couple years. There's no place pretty much on the planet Earth that has 100 combat coded fifth gen fighters. Alaska will have that because we're so strategically important. And then we're a platform for expeditionary forces. We have a lot of army units, um, active duty, reserve units that can deploy on a moment's notice anywhere in the world. Uh, the 1st Striker Brigade up in Fairbanks, the 425, that's the 4th Brigade of the 25th Infantry Division, the only airborne brigade combat team in the entire Asia Pacific. They just got back from Afghanistan, did a great job. You know, lost a couple soldiers though, so the sacrifice of our men and women, whether Alaskan-based or around the country, is still ongoing. So. Um, those are the three pillars. We also have a great and growing Coast Guard presence uh, down in Southeast Alaska. And I just had the opportunity to bring Secretary Mattis up to Alaska. Recently, we were at Isleson Air Force Base. We were at Fort Greeley and he saw it. And if you saw the press conference, the two of us did, he gets it. And the Secretary of Defense gets how important Alaska is. 
And I always say, you know, we have three pillars, but you know, there's a fourth pillar, and hopefully you saw it. We have the strongest support for the military from our communities. The average Alaskan uh, supports our military uh, in ways that I, I'm convinced no other state, no other communities do throughout the uh, United States. Uh, we have more vets per capita in Alaska than any other state in the country. So it's the whole package and uh, missile defense is certainly part of it and a growing part of it, but it's, um, it's exciting and the community supports it. And we've had a lot of, we've had a significant military buildup on all three of those pillars and it's gonna continue. Senator Sullivan, you've also talked about the fact that the natural gas pipeline, the ANWR, can be used as a dip diplomatic tool. Yeah, you know, um, Peter, I was on Meet the Press just last week talking a lot about these issues. And one of the things that I like to comment on is, um, you know, when you're unleashing American energy, the production of American energy, whether it's natural gas, whether it's oil, whether it's um, renewables, it is such a win, 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 win for our country. And it certainly is for Alaska. What do I mean? Certainly on energy security, certainly on jobs. Um, certainly, now a lot of people try to push back on this, but uh, on the environment. You know, I was in charge uh, of the, our environmental standards in Alaska when I was the Commissioner of Natural Resources uh, in the state. And I also had previously served in the Bush administration under Condoleezza Rice as an Assistant Secretary of State, in charge of economic, finance, and energy issues. So I spent a lot of time in other parts of the world, you know, where they produce oil and gas, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Azerbaijan, Kazakhstan, Brazil. I will tell you this, it's a fact, there's no place on the planet Earth that has higher standards, higher standards of producing energy than Alaska. And so my pitch has always been, if you wanna protect the global environment, and you know that we still need to continue to produce energy, we should choose the place that has the highest standards. You go to places like Russia in the Arctic, they don't give a darn about their environment. We do. You come up to the North Slope, come to Prudhoe Bay, you see the very, very high standards. So protects the environment, but also in terms of foreign policy. You know, there's a lot of discussion right now on Vladimir Putin, ways to push back on him and the Russian regime. Um, I'm fully supportive of pushing back in every way possible. But I like to share this story that's quite an interesting one. I was in a meeting with Senator McCain, who's a good friend of mine and a great American, and you know, is pro uh, your viewers know is, pro is suffering right now through some serious uh, health challenges, brain cancer right now. So I was asking everybody to keep him in their prayers. But we were in a meeting with a senior Russian dissident about a year and a half ago. And at the very end of the meeting, I asked him, well, what more can we do in terms of policies? You know, we've instituted sanctions, for example policies to be able to push back on the um, Putin regime. And he gave me an answer that I wasn't expecting. I don't think Senator McCain was expecting either. He said, the number one thing you can do in America is to produce more American energy. Why? Because, you know, in many ways, the Putin regime is a gas station masquerading as a country. And uh, when we're able to compete on global markets and provide allies of ours, whether in Asia, uh, whether in Europe, the source of reliable American energy and not be subjected to blackmail that often comes with accepting Russian energy. It benefits all of our allies, it benefits other countries, and it pushes back on the regime. So we're doing that. You know, right now we've undertaken policies where we are either close to or have actually exceeded Russia and Saudi Arabia in oil production in natural gas production, and in the production of renewable energy. And that's a, what I call the American energy renaissance. It's happening in Alaska, and hopefully you saw it, but it's happening throughout the country, and I think it benefits our economy, benefits our workers, but importantly, benefits our foreign policy and national security. That's why I'm a huge proponent of responsible development of America's abundant energy resources. And in Alaska, we have a lot of them. How's the Trump administration on these issues, in your view? I think the Trump administration has been really strong. And, um, and it's this Trump administration um, in connection with the Congress. You know, I was asked about, um, again, 
I'm, I'm someone who believes that we should be putting as much pressure on the Putin regime as possible. And we have been. You know, one of the most important ways we've done it, and you're seeing it in Alaska, is we're rebuilding the military. You know, if Putin understands one thing, it's real power. Um, you know, I agree that the, we should have administration officials talking the way in which we're acting, but at the end of the day, the actions are the things that speak the most loudly. So let me give you a couple examples. You know, from 2010 to 2016, defense spending was almost cut by 25% as threats to the United States started to dramatically increase around the world, we were continuing cutting defense spending. Well, that's changed. We have very strong bipartisan support. You don't, get a, you don't see that in the press a lot. Um, but for example, the National Defense Authorization Act, I sit on the Armed Services Committee. Um, we are all very focused, Democrats and Republicans, on increasing defense spending, including an initiative called the Re European Reassurance Initiative. It's almost $5 billion in the current NDAA that is sending our forces, um, soldiers, Marines, to places like Poland and the Baltics with um, serious you know, weapon systems and armor. That is something that Putin understands. Another area that the Trump administration has undertaken is, for example, in Ukraine. And the Ukrainians have been asking for years to have systems that can take out Russian tanks, T-72 tanks. When the Russians invaded Ukraine, there was nothing the Ukrainians had in their military that could stop a Russian tank. The previous administration wouldn't do that despite bipartisan support on the Armed Services Committee. One of the first press conferences I actually participated in was every senator on the Armed Services Committee, Democrat and Republican in 2015, saying, hey, we need to do this. Let Ukraine have weapons that they can defend themselves on. Uh, the previous administration wouldn't do that. Secretary Mattis has done that. The Ukrainians now have an anti-tank system called the Javelin. And if you're a Russian tank driver in eastern Ukraine, you might uh, be a little bit more worried right now because that system can take out a T-72 tank. But importantly, on energy. You know, we've, um, in, the, in the Congress, in the tax reform bill, we opened ANWR for exploration, responsible exploration. You've probably seen that in Alaska. That's something that uh, uh, over 70% of Alaskans, again, Democrats and Republicans, have been pushing for for almost 40 years. We finally got that done. And uh, I want to do a shout out to all my fellow Alaskans. Again, there's some people who have been working on that for decades. Um, Senator Murkowski, Congressman Young, the late great Senator Stevens, and hundreds if not thousands of Alaskans. Again, very bipartisan. We got that done finally. But I think that's going to be good for Alaska but good for the country for the reasons I talked about in terms of energy as a instrument of American power to help our allies and push back against our adversaries. And we're doing that. And as I mentioned, the numbers of uh, energy production, oil, gas, renewables are hitting all time highs and are some of the top of any country in the world. That's good for Alaska and it's good for America, and I think it's good for our allies. Senator Sullivan, in your view, has climate change affected Alaska? Oh, absolutely. I mean, you see, you guys are probably seeing it. There's no doubt climate change is happening in Alaska, and, you know, it's opening up opportunities um, that you see in the Arctic, but it's also opening up uh, significant challenges. You know, um, some of the roads that you're probably traveling on, you're seeing kind of how the permafrost uh, creates more dips in, in the roads. You know, the big area where we're seeing it is the uh, receding uh, sea ice in the Arctic that's opening up entire new areas of commerce and transportation. The Northwest Passage in the summer is creating increased traffic. What I've been arguing that we need to do is we, we need more infrastructure in the Arctic. We need more ports. The military needs to have a, a stronger presence. I'm going to try to get the Secretary of the Navy up to Alaska this summer. It's just I was exchanging phone calls with him recently on doing that. So um, we're seeing that as an important part. You know, Alaska, America, I'd like to remind all of my Senate colleagues here, we're an Arctic nation. We're an Arctic nation because of Alaska. And there's a lot going on in the Arctic. Some of it is challenges. Some of it is opportunities as well. But um, we're certainly seeing 
that uh, climate change is happening in the great state of Alaska. You're seeing some of the areas impacting our fisheries, and we're looking at the issue of ocean acidification. Um, so these are all important areas to uh, focus on, and there's certainly things that I've been focused on as a senator. Okay, sitting here in Washington, we're 3,714 miles from Juneau, yes. let alone the rest of the yes, state. Yes, yes. How, how do you communicate yeah. what's going on in Alaska to your well, colleagues? Well, look, it's a huge part of my job. It's a huge part of Lisa Murkowski's job. It's a huge part of uh, Don Young's job, and we do it. You know, I work closely, my staffs work closely, literally with my fellow uh, congressional delegation members from Alaska, not even on a daily basis, almost an hourly basis. But a big, big part of our job is talk about Alaska, talk about, like I mentioned, the three pillars of um, America's military might based in Alaska, how that, that helps the whole country. Um, I like to brag a lot about Alaska's fishing industry. You know, I sit on the Commerce Committee. I chair the subcommittee in charge of the Coast Guard, NOAA, uh, America's Fisheries. I like to describe Alaska as the superpower of seafood. Almost 60% of all the seafood harvested, commercial, recreational, subsistence, almost 60% of that for the country is Alaskan harvested seafood, which is remarkable. It's in the billions. And of course, a lot of uh, my fellow senators don't know that, but sometimes it's just the basic knowledge. You know, Peter, I was mentioning to you earlier um, that we have a tradition in the Senate. Every Thursday, a senator is asked to host a lunch for his fellow senators. About a month ago, it was my turn. I will acknowledge, and most senators, if they're telling the truth, uh, would agree that the senators kind of mark their calendar when it's the uh, senator from uh, Alaska, either myself or Senator Murkowski. And I will acknowledge uh, Susan Collins of Maine because she brings in great lobster. We, been, we bring in great um, salmon, halibut, uh, reindeer sausage I had in our last uh, uh, lunch just a couple, uh, like I said, just a month ago. Everybody really enjoys it, but you get to brag about your state. And one of the things that I did in that lunch just a month ago, you know, I not only talked about, which is of course a little bit of difficult, it's difficult for my fellow Texas senators to hear how, you know, if we split Alaska in half, Texas would be the third largest state in the country. We're two and a half times the size of Texas. But we're also a continental wide state. So what do I mean by that? If you actually superimposed Alaska on the lower 48 states, you would have cities, for example, Ketchikan in southeast Alaska, hitting kind of in the area of northern Florida, say St. Petersburg. Then Barrow, in the northern part of the state, would actually be north, the northern part of North Dakota, almost into Canada. Other parts of Alaska would be into Texas and the rest of kind of the Midwest. And then the end of the Aleutian Island chain would extend out to San Francisco. So literally, um, we are a continental-wide state, and I think sometimes um, senators don't recognize that. And of course, it creates some unique opportunities for America, for Alaska, but it also creates unique challenges. And so we are working to educate, we, I say, our congressional delegation, my, my Senate colleagues, and even some of uh, our colleagues in the House on Alaska, because sometimes there's certain special things we need uh, in federal law, and uh, it's up to the three of us to get them. And like I mentioned, ANWR was a good example. This past December, we were able to get that law passed uh, after 40 years of trying. So flying becomes a way of life in Alaska. Flying is a way of life, absolutely. You know, almost 80% of our communities are not connected on the road system. You know, you yourselves, you guys had to barge up your uh, bus up to Juneau and then, you know, um, Juneau uh, through, you know, you can't get out to the uh, rest of the, the state on a road from Juneau. We're trying, but we're not there yet. And then I know when you got to Haines, you got on the road system and uh, there's a lot of road, a lot, lot of miles of roads, but, um, you know, a lot of people get around by boat or by airplane. And uh, because we don't have roads that connect uh, so many of our communities, which again is a challenge, right? I like to say Alaska is a 
resource rich but infrastructure poor state and our delegation is constantly constantly trying to help press the uh, infrastructure needs in federal legislation we're making progress but we need uh, we need to do more in that regard finally senator sullivan brett kavanaugh yes. you used to work at the u.s court of appeals well you know uh, mm -hmm. i've known brett kavanaugh for a long time we actually served in the bush administration together and uh, followed his career very impressive career i've stayed in touch with him since i came to washington as a senator and you know i think uh, i think he was a inspired choice i've already come out uh, and said i was going to support him i actually had a very substantive meeting with him in this office just last week and what i like to tell my fellow alaskans is on issues that we really care about um, you know for example uh, the authority and power of federal agencies. A lot of Alaskans, myself included, uh, we have skepticism on providing too much authority to federal agencies. As you guys have seen, 66% of the state is owned by the federal government. You often have federal agencies that are kind of pushing the envelope of his authority. Grant, uh, Brent Kavanaugh, Judge Kavanaugh, has said correctly, and nobody argues with this, Federal agencies can act only when given authority by Congress. That's just a basic, correct legal proposition. He's been a leader on that. He's been a leader on uh, strong uh, Second Amendment rights, which uh, the vast majority of Alaskans care deeply about. Um, but he's also somebody who believes that the judge's job is to interpret federal statutes and the Constitution as written. It's not up to them to write new laws or to write new policies. That's up to the Congress, to the Senate. He's been a leader on that. So these are all areas where I think Alaskans um, certainly have strong views, uh, similarly to Judge Kavanaugh. And then finally, as like I said, I, kn I know him. Um, the one thing that when you meet him that comes across is um, humility, true humility. And as you know, Peter, that's not a it's not a characteristic you often find in Washington, D.C., and um, but I think it's actually an important characteristic for a judge in particular, and uh, that comes across. He's a good family man, so we'll have a good, I'm sure, I'm not on the Judiciary Committee, but there'll be good hearings here, but I think he's going to um, equip himself well, and uh, hopefully will be uh, the next Associate Justice on the Supreme Court. Senator Dan Sullivan, Republican of Alaska.